Collections and the tradition of this conference, the biographical data on our speaker, Dr. Altenfels, is again available in your packets. I would like to make only one additional comment. Today, universities are accused, and with a great deal of justification, that we have forgotten or are neglecting our main function, that is, teaching and providing educational experiences for the millions of college students in our universities. As I looked over the vita of our speaker, it seems that she cannot be charged guilty of this general societal charge. She has recently received the following awards. One of the three great teachers of 1970 from New York University. The Albert Einstein Medical Center Award for Teaching Excellence and the Judy Award for te Teaching, a national award for teaching of which only four are given in a year. From New York University, Professor of Educational Anthropology, Dr. Elfel Alpenfalls, Emerging Family Forms. Thank you very much for that introduction. I think I ought to add a little to the introduction from another point of view to what you added. Because I came into the field of anthropology by the way I have since learned is the best of all possible ways. That of a public school teacher, a third grade school teacher in Denver, Colorado. I taught in Denver just about four years, when one day my principal called me in, as principals used to do, and hinted that uh, she thought I'd better go to summer school and get some more education. <laughs> I took the hint. I went out to the University of California, and the campus at Berkeley then as now was a delightful place to be. And I at least came back to Denver thinking that I had more education. I taught four more years, this time at a high school level. A new principal, a gentleman this time, called me in one spring, and he too suggested he thought I needed a little more education. After eight years in the Denver public school system, it had finally reached me. They meant business about me. So this time, I took a full year off, went out to the University of Washington, and there, as all of us have in our university experience, at the end of that year, I had two dangling points. And I began to look around for a SNAP course. And everybody at the University of Washington said, take anthropology. <laughs> I took that SNAP course, anthropology, and spent the next 10 or 12 years in study and in teaching. And then one spring, the Denver Teachers Association wrote me a letter. Would I come back home that fall to speak for their Fall Teachers Institute? I had suffered under that Fall Teachers Institute <laughs> for eight long years. I was the teacher who took the cornermost seat in our civic auditorium, walked around, spotted my principal, made sure he saw I was there, and then I went out to play golf. You know with what great pleasure I accepted that invitation and I went back home to talk about my new science of anthropology. And I returned to New York City and my brothers who still live in Denver with what I thought was an overly display of brotherly love saw to it that I received not one copy of the clipping from the Denver Post but a half a dozen. And that the column was headed, Ethel Alpenfels shows need of education. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> that is a true story in the fate of all of us who elect to make teaching our profession. And so I'm delighted you gave me a chance to use it because what I'm going to say today, you may end and say, as you hear me, I do need more education in the family today and our world. I think, too, it is very appropriate that your committee chose an anthropologist to speak the last day. For I always define my science simply as the science of leftovers. We in anthropology study everything that has been left over by every other discipline. And so, as you know, the historian is concerned only with people who have written language. We in anthropology push time back before man wrote. The psychologists among you want to get each one of us into your laboratories under controlled conditions. We who study man in his natural habitat found out a long time ago that man is not always going to stand long enough, still long enough to get him into a laboratory. And I think sometimes this is why the anthropologist has been forced to make the world his laboratory. And so as we're learning so much today, the importance of language and of linguistics Indeed, we in anthropology have to spend two years in the field of linguistics, and they're concerned with two things, with grammatical structure, with vocabulary. But I must confess to you, we in anthropology use the language as people speak, not only to trace their movements across the face of the globe, but in the words you and I use every day, in the words you use in your own profession, the anthropologist finds many of the problems of the past, many of the stereotypes of the past, and the prejudices of the past that still linger in the present to plague us. And so by way of illustrating what I believe a very important point in this conference of yours from the point of view of an anthropologist is that the past does live in the present, that one of the places to look is in language. And so I wanted quickly, because of your own concern with India, to talk of a personal experience. It's now 11 years ago when one of our uni engineers at NYU invented a new solar stove. Ford Foundation granted our university $45,000 to perfect that solar stove. I may be biased because I thought it was a part of wisdom when Ford Foundation tied to that grant. It is not enough for the specialists of the West. It is not enough for the engineers of the West to uh, try to present a new stove or a new idea to the people of another nation. They must do a second and equally important thing. They must have a team of behavioral scientists, the psychologists, the sociologists, the anthropologists. And this team would have two jobs. They would decide the nation into which the solar stove would be introduced. And second, to do the thing that I think you have to help young people today in more than in any other way. They have to, if you want to introduce a new machine or a new instrument into the school, if you want to introduce a new idea into perhaps the president's office, how do you go about it to do it most effectively? Well, I had the good luck to head up that team of behavioral scientists, and we had no difficulty at all choosing the nation into which we would introduce the stove. We chose India. We chose India because, as all of you know, it is a land of rain and of monsoons. And we said in a climate like that, if a stove heated by the rays of the sun worked there, it would be very effective for the deserts of the world for which that stove had originally been designed. I chose India because they speak English, and that would help. There were many reasons. One of them that just might interest you is that there has only been one invention ever made by the West, ever offered to the women of any tribe or of any nation, that was accepted immediately. I'm sure you know that invention. It was the sewing machine. And the country that accepted it immediately was India. And the woman who literally introduced it to India overnight <coughs> agreed to come to the United States to be our consultant. Well, I wrote a report of 350 pages. I'll spare you those 350 pages. What were some of the things we recommended? We said for that stove to be effective in India and the villages of India, it should be no taller than a foot or a foot and a half in height. For in India today, a woman does not stand when she cooks. She always sits down. And they're very practical. If you ask them why, they'll tell you. It tires them to stand. That's why they sit down. We asked that the stove be small. It was about half the size of this podium. For in India, in these tiny villages, a woman must wash her stove before and after every single use. And so an hour after sunrise, I would see them washing their stoves for the first time 
with water and sacred dung. At night, one hour before sunset, sometimes one hour after sunset, they would wash it for the last time with water and sacred ashes. But of all the things we asked our engineers to do, the one thing we had the greatest difficulty in selling them was, please design a stove that can be operated only with the right hand. For over in India today, everything that is good and clean is done with the right hand. Everything they believe unclean is done with the left hand. And I believe still today in India, the cleanest thing a woman does is to cook. So before she enters her kitchen, she always takes a bath. In what we were able to estimate as 200 tiny villages of India, she never entered her kitchen unless her sari was soaking wet. And even in the large city like New Delhi or Bombay, the orthodox Hindu woman will not cook unless her husband has provided her with a sari made of pure silk and she cooks only with her right hand. But if you're the midwife in India today and the village is there, this is not clean. So you don't take a bath, you don't put on fresh clothes and every operation is done with the left hand and endlessly in India. I would meet these women coming down the trail toward me, carrying their babies on the left hip with the left arm hanging out. For if this morning for the next few minutes, you will look at India or the United States of the world as the anthropologist does. Look at our own society, where we teach our girls and our women that their most important job is to take care of babies. Watch how a mother carries that firstborn baby. She nearly always carries it in her right arm, thus silently telling all of us she's got no more important thing to do than when she has this baby in her arm. In India, it's on the left hip. In one year, every Indian I met, woman I met, I would try to touch that left hand as it hung out. Never once did I even get near it. I don't know how they did it. They got that left hand down, they pulled the right hand out. And I would protest, and the Indian women do not speak as I do. But what they would be saying to me in answer was, this strange custom of you, the foreigner, to shake hands with the right hand is good. It must be done with that hand. And so I ask you to look at our own American English language that has come by way of the Indo-European from the ancient Sanskrit of India and look at some of the words why we have the same concepts of left and right as does the Indian. One Indo-European word for left is gauche. It means you're not only left-handed but you are also awkward. There is another Indo-European word for left and it is sinister. You're not only awkward but you are also evil. And in those glorious days when knighthood was in flower and men all over northern Europe rode around singing of our gentleness and of our beauty, the illegitimate son always had to have a bar or bend sinister across his family crest to tell all the rest of us he had been born on the left side, the evil side of his mother. While the word for right in French is D-R-O-I-T, it does mean right. Put a capital letter to that word and what do you have? The law, right in the eyes of society. How many words do you and I use today that have moved out of the physical sense like these words left and right into the moral, into the ethical, and even into the spiritual beliefs of the West? Two summers ago, I had a young Catholic priest in my class. He teaches at Fordham University, and he gave me one of those precious papers you get occasionally in teaching. In this paper, seven and one half pages long, he listed the citations, not the quotations, just the citations from the Bible to prove to me that God is right-handed, that Jesus Christ stands at God's right side, that all of you who are wise enough to come to this conference when you go to heaven will be good angels and you will stand on the right side of God, that all the efficacious sacrifices made from the Bible are always made from the right side of an animal. And if any of you want to know what to do with all those left hand, evil, awkward friends of yours in this room today, this young priest pointed out the Bible tells you, for Judges says, you cannot trust a left-handed man. <laughs> I'd be curious, how many left-handed men and women do we have in this room? 
It was Dr. Wilton M. Krogman of the University of Pennsylvania who did the definitive study. 10% of us in this room are truly left-handed. 40% of us are truly right-handed. The other 50% ambidextrous and as you know dexterous means to be right-handed so we're just one up on you we have two right hands <laughs> and so because I suspect that everyone at least the male speakers at this conference have not escaped the new woman's lib movement let me add my little bit I think that it is time to begin to teach the women of the West that we are the only women in the world who walk around every day telling our men we are superior, they are superior, for we are the only women in the world who button our clothes on the left, the evil and the awkward side. <laughs> And so, taking groups abroad the past 12 years, anthropology groups, one of my favorite places has always been Japan. And one of the things that all former school teachers and ex-GIs want to do is to go swimming in one of those Japanese swimming pools. Some of you may know why they want to go swimming in them. <laughs> But at any rate, upon Hawaii, they decide what day where they will have the courage. And so the last time I was there, sitting in a hotel in the northern island of Hokkaido, I suddenly saw 26 men and women come out of a door dressed in Japanese kimonos on their way to the swimming pool. I was on the way to the people. But at any rate, the little Japanese woman who was sitting next to me saw them leap forward, ran forward, stopped every one of the women. They had all folded their kimonos to the left as we button our clothes. She made them all open them up and fold them to the right. For in Japan today, only a dead woman can wear a kimono buttoned on the left. And she apparently wanted no symbolic dead American women in that swimming pool. In other words, what I'm asking you today, that if you would really teach and prepare our students for the world in which they live, there, are, there is the anthropological approach we like to call holistic, to study the whole of the world, for well, today in our transportation, today in instant communication, one of the greatest things that can be given, especially to those who work with the home and the families and tend to teach this across our country, is an understanding of the world. Well, I've suggested as I began that anthropology, studying leftover, is good to have at the end of a conference. It also has its drawbacks. For perhaps in a subject such as mine, these emerging family forms, each specialist, in the light of the great changes of his discipline, would see and show how it impinges on the family. And so I suspect that you have talked a great deal about change. Anthropologists would say the one constant thing in your life and mine is constant change. We know of no society that did not change in the past, and we know of no institution or society that is not changing in the present. What is new for our time, as everyone I'm sure has pointed out, is the rapidity of that change, a rapidity so vast that Dr. Oppenheimer, once walking across his farm in Massachusetts, said, even the earth is altering under my feet, a rapidity so vast that the students who entered your university this fall are very different from the class that's graduating this next spring. Four years a generation, or perhaps even as I talk, three years a generation. Yes, rapidity of change, but something else that everybody's talked about, and that is the influence of technology upon our people and our society and upon the family in particular. Yes, the Smithsonian Institute did their famous study in 1960, and they said that in the next 10 to 15 years, that our inventions, our technological inventions, would double themselves. In fact, you have to see only to look at medicine to know how much is taking place. There is no medication that was good in 1935 that is still good today, except something you may have to take occasionally, aspirin. In other words, the changes have been vast. But yes, change is constant. And so turning to look at the family and at the society of today, anthropologists looking at the world picture would say that in order to have a healthy society, you must have a healthy family. And a family to remain healthy must change with a changing society. And so I did some work among the Indians in the Amazon, and they have a word for adult, which when translated into English means, he who walks around remembering. Remember when I was young, 
Children were more respectful of their parents than they are today. Remember when I was young, there were more close associations in the family than there are today. Walking around remembering, may I also say that I truly believe that we adults are also walking around forgetting, for we have constantly remembered the Victorian family. And I would suggest that if our students really pushed back the curtains of some of those families, we wouldn't like what we saw inside. And we are constantly talking about the family in which I was raised in Colorado, and many of you in Iowa, the farm family, at a time in which less than 5% of this country live on the farm. No, we must stop constantly remembering the past, Yes, there is plenty that is good, but unless we begin to see the new emerging forms of the family, the new ideas of our society, we cannot hope to maintain the family here. For I would suggest to you that anthropologists among all the disciplines believe that the family is one of the key institutions and the best institution man has ever created for the care and the education of children, and that if it is falling to pieces, it is in context of the total society. And so how would an anthropologist look at it? How would it, they say one suggest your students look at it? And we turn immediately to our beloved concept of culture. With such close cooperation and such a good department in anthropology and sociology here, you don't have to have a definition of what is culture. I think Edward Hall's definition, the silent language, is the best. The culture is the silent language, the nonverbal language of our behavior that speaks far louder than any words we use. And so we do have a, cu a culture, a silent language between nations. When I was at the University of Chicago, we had the young American soldiers who were going to be sent to Japan there to stand between General MacArthur and the Japanese people. These 200 young men learned the Japanese language, they learned the Japanese culture. But if anthropology helped them at all, it helped them to listen to and to hear the silent language of the Japanese. I remember one quickly, we said, never call a Japanese man as you call an American man. Hey, you come here. That's the way the Japanese calls his pig or his dog, and he'll turn and run away from you. Even today, if you go to our outside a large city like Kyoto or Tokyo, and you want to call a Japanese man, you simply bend your fingers toward him. And so there is in the study of the family the silent language of our many ethnic groups and the many different ethnic families here in our own country. We in the East are learning of the Puerto Rican. The Puerto Rican boy, new come from San Juan, has been taught by his father that if he is a respectful son, he never looks his father in the eye when he speaks to him. He must always speak to his father with eyes downcast. And then he comes to my class, and what do I say? You know, look me straight in the eye. I'm sure we know in 1971 that looking people in the eye has nothing at all to do with honesty. It's got a lot to do with etiquette. And more important, it is the silent language we're teaching our children and youth. It is a sign of respect to look a person in the eye. But that Puerto Rican boy has got to remember, when I'm home at night, keep my eyes down at the floor. When I'm at school, look the professor in the eye. There is a silent language, though some of the men may doubt it, between the sexes. I happen to have an apartment in Greenwich Village. We have a rumor there that you really can't tell a man from a woman when you walk down the street behind them. Well, there is some difficulty. The same tight, dark shirt, the tight, dark pants, the uncut hair, the untaken bath but watch how they carry their bundles. I don't know where we teach men to carry bundles and packages with arms straight down. Women, we bundle them up to our bosoms and down the street we go. Look at your fingernails. All the men in this room, at least hopefully, will look at their fingernails like this. All of the women will begin waving their fingernails in the air. The silent language of the sexes. There is, believe it or not, still a silent language in attitudes toward pain. And so a man from Italy, two, three generations removed, responds to pain quite differently than, say, does the son of a man of Jewish faith from Eastern Europe, and both quite differently from a man of Polish background. And if you're lucky enough to have a Polish man uh, working for you, or one you know, let him come sometime to tell you for five minutes how 
how sick he feels. And then for the only time in your life here in the United States, you will have the undivided attention from someone else while you tell him how sick you have been. And then you can both get down to business. And so, as anthropologists have shown, there is a silent language, a cultural difference in drug addiction, in alcoholism, even in mental illness. I see many people of Irish background in this audience, and if you happen to come from Ireland, and a young man in your family suffers from schizophrenia, in the mother-dominated families, Irish families of the United States still today, that Irish schizophrenic will behave quite differently than does the Italian schizophrenic. In the father-dominated Italian home, as Dr. Oppler showed in two 10-year studies, the Irish schizophrenic tends to withdraw. The Italian schizophrenic becomes aggressive. And so today, of all the material that must go into new curriculum, is that silent language or that culture of what we in anthropology call the culture of poverty, the hard center, the hard core of the city, the poor of our cities, for they are on the move today. And we who so often talk about the money being the key, no, the money is not the key. It is as in every one of these culture groups, it is the way in which they see their world. It is the way in which they respond to authority, to education, to the society. It is the way they participate. And so turning to the family, there is the culture of the family, the silent culture that we of middle class America who do the teaching forget about the many families of our own nation, much less the many families of the world. And so turning to a principle or a concept for values are useless unless they are tied to a concept. I wanted to point out the one that Alexander Goldenweiser called the law of limited possibilities. He said there are only a limited number of possibilities in which a family can be grouped, that there are only four ways. Group marriage, one man and many women, one woman and many men, and monogamy. And so I'd like to say there are only three ways in which you can teach people to orient their children for the families of the future. You can either teach children to honor marriage or you can teach them to honor parenthood. There is a third choice. No society has yet done it, and that is to honor both. And I suggest to you that the many ethnic groups in our country, as well as in the world, still teach their children to honor parenthood. But educated, professional, no middle America are not teaching their children to honor parenthood. They are teaching them to honor marriage. So that a little boy growing up in the United States in such families is taught by his father not how to be a good father to his future son, but how to be a good husband to his future wife. And little girls from beginning on, modeling after mother, high heels, uplift brassiere or no brassiere at all, long skirts, I don't see that as motherhood. It is instead to think of her as a marriage partner. Until today, Mother's Day, I think, has become a day of atonement in which we atone for all the things we should have done for mother all the rest of the year. This is the direction of our society, and then let's look at the trends and the forms it is taking. If you will look at marriage today, I'm sure you know, we have become the most marrying people in the world. A little girl in kindergarten already knows the purpose of her life. It is to get her man. And I suggest to you there isn't a kindergarten girl in America that does not know how it is done. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And so if you look at the statistics that are pouring in, one that I read that I quote, but statistics can prove most anything, but I quote it anyway, that 40% of the marriages of girls and women last year, 40% of them, the girls were between the ages of 15 and 19. 15 and 19. So we're marrying younger. Not only are we marrying younger, but we're having our children earlier. And in a chapter I did for a book a couple of years ago, the average age of a woman when her last child was born today in the United States is 26 and a half. 
Why she'll only be in her early 30s when that last child is in school and something else is going to happen because of our emphasis on marriage. We're going to become grandparents earlier and that's exactly what we are. Grandparents at 36, at 38, at 40 to 42 in a society that sends its grandparents to retirement towns in Florida and in California where they write pathetic articles of how much they love their retirement town. For surely one of the changes that must come and should be taught, I think, is the change that all of us, as we grow older, want to spend our last years where we had our best years. And it may well be this winter coming up will be as bad as last one, and if so, I want to be here in the retirement town in Florida and California. But we must begin to see the importance of all ages, and it must be taught in such departments and such colleges as yours right here in Iowa. For as we look at these statistics, in a society that takes its children away so very young, I've asked French mothers, when are your babies no longer babies but children? And they will say when they are five years old. I've asked endless mothers, and maybe it's only in the east and the far west, when is your baby no longer a baby but a child? And we say two and a half. And so our children leave us earlier. We're going to be parents perhaps 20 years we're going to be husbands and wives maybe 50 or 60 years. And perhaps the new trend to help young people to become better husbands and wives may produce better fathers and mothers. And so the first concept of importance in changing and affecting the form for the American family has quietly changed. And one of the key changes, I think, is the change in the role of men and women. And so when I first came from the far west to live in New York City, we have a campus there. Some of you may know it. It's Washington Square, about 18 blocks of solid cement. But a lot of education goes on there. And I've never forgotten the day I sat and saw a little boy, about two or three, playing. And the inevitable soon happened on that cement. He fell down, and he skinned his knee, and he started to cry. And the mother swept him up and she kissed him and said, Johnny, don't cry. Mother won't love you if you cry. And that mother, like too many middle American mothers, took her love away from her son because for some strange reason, little boys are not supposed to cry. The nation who learned so much from World War I as a result of shell shock. We learned so much that in World War II, we let our young soldiers admit they were afraid, and our army published its now famous volume on fear. For of all the statistics I asked you to look at, not the statistics of the great explosion of population, but the awful statistic of early death of men in our country, the early death of our professional men, the college professor, the doctor, the lawyer, and all the rest. And so for nine years I have been involved in a study in why our men are dying so young. And I've asked them all over this nation, and they've answered almost in one voice, we are working to provide our wives and our children with what other men are giving theirs. But you know an anthropologist, I would immediately say that if there is an unmarried woman in this audience, a professional woman, the chances are she carries as heavy a financial load as any of the men with families in this university. For we've got a good old Protestant ethic, and it is that the unmarried daughter shall support a family she had no chance to choose, her father or her mother, her uncle or her aunt. And I who teach have 
have seen so many women in my 20 years of graduate work who could not finish, who could not do the PhD they so desperately needed because of the financial responsibility back home. And these women haven't got the ulcers, they are not suffering from hypertension, and they are not p dropping off from heart attacks. The answer seems to be, and I only mention this in passing, the failure to allow our men the opportunity to show their emotion. There's nothing I could do today but men, perhaps the women would say it's a woman. The only time I don't want anyone to say it is when they're driving a car behind me. But in other words, I can. Our men cannot show their emotion. If there is one thing that will affect the form of the family of the future, it is the new masculinity that is already here. There are no more forests to cut down. There are no more, there's no more logs to chop up unless you're going somewhere for to play on the weekend. Our new masculinity is in the title that our men hold, and they must constantly be pushed upward, up the status ladder to be the title of professor, to be the title of chairman of department, to be the president of the university. I might just in passing give you a side, we're just choosing a new chairman of our division at NYU of the behavioral sciences, and we're a democracy, we all have a vote and so there are nine men concerned and so I had nine luncheon dates I took every one of them and got nine free meals there's only <laughs> there's only one of those men who really wants it there's only one of those men who's really qualified and yet when that new chairman is appointed as you in university life know well Will the wife say to him, why did Jim get it? You work longer, you work harder, you do more than anyone else. No, his masculinity is there. And so the men will say as my own graduate students, but isn't it true the men are losing their dominance? If there is another thing you must help young men and women to know as they go out to look at the family, that the young married couple today, the man has far more power, far more dominance in his family than ever his father or his grandfather had. I could give you statistics. Let me use a personal story because it tells it better, my own family. My father was an engineer, my father born in Germany. And you know, German father's absolutely ruthless with his sons, gentle to his only daughter. And so he'd go away on a trip and he'd lay down the laws of what my brothers must do. They never answered back, no, they made a beeline for my mother. And down through the years, my mother's gentle voice always, boys, she'd say, just settle down. Wait till your father goes and we'll take care of the matter. And in my family, in my authoritarian German family, it was my mother who took care of the matter. And my brothers agree with me today that not once in my father's life did he ever doubt but that he was the head of his household. Let me give you just one example, one question to illustrate today. I've been working with 200 young soldiers, 18 to 25. One question. How many of you were put to bed by your fathers? Men so young in the Far East, only seven. How many of you had put your own children to bed? And out of 200 men, only one said he had not. And when I broke him down, he was the only unmarried man in the entire <laughs> group. No, the roles of men have changed, and with them, the roles of women. And I think you must deeply, in this part of the country, begin to teach that the either-or concept of women, just as for work and play, is not true. That a woman can be only a good wife and mother, or a good career woman. She cannot be both at the same time. When all the evidence that a woman anthropologist looking across the world can see is that in most societies a woman is both a good wife and mother and a good career woman as well. My latest candidate is back from a headhunting house in the Borneo to ask why Asian women can be elected as the head of their nation when I always thought they were taught to walk behind their men and that we taught our daughters for freedom, for leadership, and for mobility, and yet our daughters do not have mobility, they do not take their leadership as they should. And so to begin to say what new studies are now showing of one of my students is doing, that it is the working mother who is proving to be a better mother than the mother who is there 24 hours a day. Oh yes, she's got a lot of guilt because we're all worried about her, 
But when she comes home, she listens. When she comes home, she communicates. And if there is anything for the future family of America, it is that adults and parents must begin to listen, as the university professor must begin to listen to what is being said by the young people in their societies. But that working mother does. And so there is a changing feminine role. And I think the key point is that we have dichotomized human beings into femininity and masculinity. And there is almost nothing except bearing children around the world that the anthropologists cannot find a society that what men do here is done somewhere else by women and vice versa. So that little boys and little girls like ourselves have grown up into men and women acting like we are supposed to act and not as our abilities or our desires may be. And that when we help young people, young married couples and the families to teach that both boys and girls have equal opportunities, they're both good in mathematics, they're both good in English if that's their thing, then they will be also free. Free as you must begin to teach, free as human beings. And so the families and structural types we look out, and if you will look closely at all the recommendations of all the specialists in our nation and in the world, they all have to do with marriage rather than with the family. Oh yes, marriage impinges on the family and will change the form of the family. And whether it's the trial marriage of Margaret Mead or the marriage on five-year plan in which you sign a contract and then you can break it after five years, whether it's group marriage or even the commune, and I'm working in the commune in the east side of New York now today, and I say to you, the family is in that commune. Oh, there's different marriage because we've so taught individualism to people that personal happiness and personal fulfillment is the key to family living today. But let me give you one example from the commune, a young woman and her husband and two children. Do they live with everybody else in this widely publicized commune that's supposed to be so free? She was horrible. Of course they don't. They have a little special place, but it's just for privacy. And I suggest to you the four walls of a house are also for privacy. For what they are doing there within that home is the single universal function of the family today, the care and education of babies and children. And so you could look at all of these and instead turn and look at what lies ahead. And so quickly as my time is almost gone, let me end to say that we live, as you have learned these three days, truly in an age of transition. We cannot really, no matter what all specialists say, forecast what the future will hold. For it is a future that you and I cannot even possibly imagine. But what we can do, I think, is to begin in teaching and this is why your conference is so important. For what happens here will move out all across this country and all across middle America and accent upon human beings rather than upon femininity and masculinity. For men are going to have much happier wives to live with when that happens. And the good thing, the compartmentalization that has gone on will disappear. So many authorities say that as you move into the future, the experiences of men and women are going to be so different that we're going to become depersonalized, that we're going to move apart, and therefore marriage wasn't, can't last more than three or five years, and then we better get another partner. I say we have forgotten the Victorian home and we have forgotten the farm home and we have forgotten the suburban home where women are only housekeepers and nothing more, where they are supposed to find their fulfillment in home and the men are out in the field at work with all the excitement, at least the woman thinks, that it is the working mother today and over 60% of our nation are doing this that are sharing experiences with their own husbands and are going to come back, I truly believe, though many will disagree with me, into a smaller family, but into a family in which there is love. For you and I cannot learn to love someone else unless we had the good fortune to be raised in a family where there was love. It will be a family in which respect is taught, not respect for someone else, but the key respect, respect for self. 
for I will not respect you and you will not respect me unless we had a family that taught us to respect ourselves. Second, I think parenthood. It is the only profession for which there is no prerequisite. Now we come into a time which offers choice and variety, and it must be this whole perspective that you begin to teach a choice and a variety. And last, to truly recognize that the family has become the one institution that carries all the burdens and all the problems of every other institution. There was a day when men could talk of economics and politics outside the home with their friends. Today they don't dare to. They might lose their job. They talk about it at home. It is the family that must bear the burden and this must be shared. Can you help young people to see that the family must share these burdens? And so there are emerging changes in the world, changes that affect the family, and there are emerging families. But I suggest to you my title this morning could well have been, Tomorrow is Today. For there is nothing in that tomorrow that is not already here today, as there is nothing in our today that wasn't present yesterday. And in that tomorrow that is here today, what are the trends? Can you here in Iowa begin to teach what is truly so? We live in a non-white world that well over 73% of the world's population lives in Asia and it's mongoloid and non-white. That over 20% of the world is in Africa and it is non-white. There are more non-whites in North and South America at this very moment than there are whites. The population spe specialists tell us by the end of the century, South America will have twice the population of North America. Yes, that must be looked at in families, to look at the families of America and of the world. Second trend for the future, emerging change is the shift of generations. That by the time many of the students in your college today reach the age of 30 or 40, 70 to 75 percent of the wealth of this nation will be in the hands of men and women over 70 years of age. And we continue to teach that youth is the only important age. Uh, the TV spent three million dollars to find out what youth wanted on their programs on TV and we're suffering with them now. No, there is a shift in generations and youth wants to know, it really wants to know. And last, Yes, we live in this technological world, but this machine is man's friend. It is the friend of the family, offering to the family a leisure, which if we had the courage to begin to teach today, what kind of leisure? And stop the either or that work is the thing I have to do only because I want to play, and that play is my escape from reality. For we move into the shorter day and the shorter week with leisure time. One of the key things in your planning is to really look at leisure, what kind of leisure for the future. And so I close by saying there is no skill you can teach your students unless it is the skill of thinking, but that skill is going to be obsolete in another 10 or 15 years. There is no machine that youth can learn to run, even an electronic computer, computer, but that machine is going to be in a museum in another five or 10 years. What has education learned? If we have learned anything, it's this. Of all the facts we cram into our students' head each examination period, how many of them will be transferred? You and I know practically none. The only true transfer of learning comes through principle, through concepts, and above all else, through attitudes. And so I ask in teaching and preparing for the family of the future, how can we keep alive that attitude of curiosity so rich in little children that somehow as students go through high school tends to disappear? And though I'm sure it doesn't happen in Iowa, it does at NYU, by the time we've had our students four years, it's almost gone. We had a little trouble last year in some of our colleges, and so in NYU we closed a little early. And I went to my only undergraduate class at 420 and forgot what time it was and said good morning to them. No one answered. They were too busy writing it down.
How do we keep alive an attitude of honest doubt so good in your science and therefore good in every other area? Most important, how can we begin to teach the thing that both adult and youth lead in family living? Responsibility. For children learn in only four ways in the world, and they learn most important by imitating their adults. And I suggest that we haven't made parenthood desirable. And until we take the responsibility of making it desirable and something to be lived, only then will youth change. And so let me close with something that Lillian Smith once said, and I'd just like to close with it because it sums up what I've said. She said, this is the sin of you and me and all of us, to have more power than love, more knowledge than understanding, more information about this earth than of the people who live upon it, more skill to fly to far off places than to stop a moment and look within the secret spots of our own hearts. For freedom is a dreadful word, unless it goes hand in hand with responsibility, and democracy is going to disappear from the face of the earth, unless the hearts and the minds of men grow mature. Thank you. Anthropology was described as having, among others, two distinctive elements, taking what was left over and the holistic approach. I think our speaker has used these two elements in taking many things that were left over and putting them together in a holistic framework. I was especially interested in the emphasis in the presentation on what we should teach and teaching, which seems to me to lead very logically into the program this afternoon, the second century targets for home economics. I've been asked to announce that for those of you who have tickets, the luncheon will be promptly at 12. In fact, the doors will be open a few minutes before 12. Uh, serving will be at 12.15. Please be seated before that time. Uh, an announcement, Dr. Cale Prophet and Dr. Margaret Osborne, please meet Dr. Francis Carlin in the back of the room at the close of the meeting. Julie, is there anything else? Thank you very much for your kind attention, and see you this afternoon. <laughs>